everyone gets back on their phones and you know we're kind of everyone's going through social media and you're like neil like you're, you're kind of like showing up on a lot of memes right now dude <laughs> yeah, you're everywhere dude <laughs> Four play presented by Barstool Sports. We got myself at Dan Rappaport. We got a big show. Neil Shipley, the low amateur at the Masters Tournament, who played with Tiger Woods on Sunday, who also was staring at God knows what during the ceremony in Butler Cabin, is joining the show. He just returned to Ohio State where he's a grad student. I saw a bunch of the footage of everybody going nuts for him, showering him on the return, the whole deal. So we haven't talked to him yet. I'm very excited for that. He seems like a total beauty. I imagine he's got a bunch of great stories about playing with Tiger, and he's got a few questions to answer. So he's coming up for the uh, second half of the show. <sighs> the boys, Frankie and Trent, are at the RBC Heritage, which is elevated event, big field. All the stars are pretty much there. I saw their chit-chatting with Rory um, uh, and our boy, why am I blanking, uh, the Irish guy we had on. Shane Lowry? Shane Lowry. Him and Shane Lowry were hanging out on the green. I saw Colin Morikawa was teaching – Trent Daddy to try to putt with the claw. Have you ever putted with the claw grip, Dan? I I putt with the claw. You do. Yeah, you're gonna see. Yeah, okay. I've right. I've I've uh, done it for the last like three months. You'll see this uh, this Myrtle Beach video is coming out next week, and Alex Bush knows all about the claw. The claw. I, it, you know when he said it because I heard Colin. It's a great little clip, and the, f- those guys are playing in the pro am. So everybody's kind of on the putting green together. Tillery's there. Tillery, I think, is getting. You know, he he gets an undated with. Uh, messages about how come Trent Ryan hasn't broke in 90 yet. So Tillery is rooting for Trent to play well more than anyone on earth. So he's there. Colin's there. And they're working on Trent's putting. And I liked when he said, yeah, it, it, like you do the claw grip and then with your claw hand, it feels like you just like push your hand towards the hole is what he said. Yeah, it's like, it's weird. It's like your hand feels like, because when it's over the club, it kind of feels like it's in a straight line with the hole. And then you're right. You just kind of push it down the line. For me, it was like, it's it's pretty much impossible to get quick with a claw. Like my my fault yeah. with putting is I get I get quick and kind of jerky with the hands and I I pull a lot of putts and kind of and with the claw you like can't do it it'll fall out of your hand. Okay, and I've never tried it before. I'm, I'm going to try it. What do you mean? Why are you messing with the best part of your no, no, game? No, no, I don't mean try it as a permanent. I just I've never even taken a single stroke with the claw grip. So I just want to like I just want to have been there before. And That's see crazy to me that you've never. T- I've, I feel like I've tried every single grip <laughs> under the fucking sun. I've done left hand low. I've done pencil, which is different from the claw. You know, I've done. I've done the one where like you got both hands going down the shaft. You've only ever done conventional. I don't do conventional. I do. I do my normal uh, interlock grip, and then I just take my fingers and uninterlock them. And the only reason I do that is because that's what Tiger Woods does. And I learned that twenty years ago. I heard him talking about that. He's like, yeah, I have conventional grip. But you know where your fingers, where your fingers interlock here, he just takes. I guess it would be your left index finger, and instead of interweaving that with your pinky, you just kind of set it on top in between your right hand ring finger and pinky finger. I only do that because that's what Tiger Woods does, and that's the only way I've ever putted. I did experiment a little bit in 2015 when Spieth was the big thing, and he was like left hand low was kind of the first guy that was he was winning everything. My brother went left hand low, and then I went left hand low occasionally, but not for very long. Yeah, it's it's tough. the The hardest part about switching a putting grip is speed. Like the 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 four yeah. footers, you know, and you can get sucked into it, especially if you're at like a you know indoor, and it's like you don't really have to worry about speed. Mm-hmm. Then you can hit it straight. But it's it, so I was doing claw only inside twenty twenty five feet. It was kind of a feel thing. But then once you do it, I've had it for like four months now. Then you just start hitting so many putts with it that the other one feels uncomfortable. And so now I'm doing it from everywhere. This episode is presented by our great friends at Chevy. They are our presenting sponsor of Foreplay. Great episode we've got today. And with golf season in full swing, Chevy wants to help you make the most of every drive. And the all-electric Blazer EV's bold design and dynamic performance make it the perfect electric vehicle to get you to the course in style and comfort we love the blazer ev don't we dan i miss chevy i i really i miss chevy i'm glad they're back it didn't feel right uh you know there's just something about that iconic bow tie that feels like home i think a lot of america feels that way and the foreplay podcast definitely feels that way this bad boy the old blazer ev by the way has earned the prestigious honor of being named motor trends 2024 suv of the year Motor Trend judged big, small, gas, hybrid, electric vehicle, luxury SUVs, all of it. And Blazer EV beat them all, Dan. 
Yeah. It's, it's you know, that's what they do. They've got the 17.7 inch standard diagonal display screen. No other competitor offers a larger screen. The all electric Blazer EV offers incredible views with that expansive 17.7 inch diagonal display. Uh, with Blazer EV's unique styling, comfort driven interior, incredibly smooth ride, and responsive handling, Chevy has teed up the perfect electric vehicle to help you get anywhere you want to be. Head over to Chevy.com slash Blazer EV to check out lease offers and amazing deals. That is Chevy.com slash Blazer EV. Chevrolet together. Let's drive. In this job, for whatever reason, you you dissect your own golf game more than you used to. And I don't mean that you care. Like we used to we've always cared about our golf game, but sort of in like um a tangential relationship to it of like, yeah, I'm kind of working on this swing thought, but whatever. Whereas now, like because of what people comment, because of how many conversations you have with people, because we're on camera so much, you actually like feel like you learn a lot about your own game. And I've thought a lot about my putting because like people shit on my putting strokes. So I'm like, am I actually have a horrible putting stroke? But I usually, everybody thinks I putt well, what's going on here? And I honestly think it's because my pace is good. I think that's like the only thing about my putting that I can really come up with that stands out that like, if you have like putting is pace and there's days where we all go out there and you can see it with Tiger even last weekend where he just didn't have the pace. He's just coming up short the whole time. When you don't have pace, we've all been there a million times when your pace is just fucking off. You can't make anything and you can't get it within like that three and a half feet. And it's infuriating all day long. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the hardest. So I, um, I got a lesson from Steven Sweeney, who's actually Collins putting coach and Akshay co coaches a couple other guys. And he basically said that putting is, three aspects, right? It's starting it online, it's the read, and it's speed. And starting it online really just is not very difficult. If you get a 15 handicap on one of those perfect putty mats and it's dead flat, they're going to make like a lot of those putts. Yeah. Right? And with reading, there's all these systems now where, you know, I, not that an amateur is going to learn aim point, but you can kind of turn it into a science. And, but speed is the hardest one. And, and speed, you're right. Speed is like, you know, this, and you, you see these breakdowns of a putt that's like, you know, it might be it might be a foot out on the left, but it's a foot out on the left at a certain speed. And if you hit it five feet by, it's only, you know, six inches out. So I, I do think that's right. I think you tend to like kind of have it dying by the hole, which is a really, really good pace. Yeah, which I don't know how I do that. Like there's times where I, when I don't have good pace where you stand over a 14 footer and you legitimately are like, I don't know what I'm supposed to think about to get this to go 14 feet. Like, what am I supposed to think about? I don't, there's no... You know, and I get why people occasionally will go to looking at the hole because, you know, we've talked about it a bunch, but it's in baseball, you look at the person and then throw the baseball to them. In football, you look at the person and throw the football to them. In golf, you look straight down at the ground and then put it to something that you uh, are looking at that's an arbitrary distance away. It's crazy. It's like, that's just not yeah. now. The sport that came into my head was bowling because it's kind of similar to bowling. And bowling, you look at the pins, right? You don't look at the ball. Bowling, you look at the pins. Uh, like, you know, hockey, like Shuffle playing board. hockey, when you when you come down, like you're supposed to have your head up and looking at the goalie when you shoot. Like you, if you have your head down, A, you'll get killed by a defenseman. And B, you just won't know where the net is. You, you, you know, you skate around, you shoot with your head up. So it's like you're always looking kind of at the target in almost every sport I could think of except golf. You're not looking. You're just looking. You're basically looking down at like however much your peripheral is really like a, a four foot by four foot, you know rectangle that is where your peripherals are focused that's all you can see and it's pretty much just green and a club face and a golf ball every yeah. single time and it's that's nuts that you then have to judge the distance like i'm always amazed at those guys when they hit those bunker shots so good because of you know like hitting a bunker shot 14 yards and then 17 and a half yards for us there's no difference to that i don't know how you would even begin to hit it different yet they hit it within three or four or five feet all the time, which means they just know like, oh, I'm going to hit this a couple feet harder out of this giant pit of sand over this giant ridge to agree that like it's nuts how good they are in those shots. Yeah, I think it's just repetition. I don't think they're thinking about it. I think it's just you've done it so many times that like you can feel it. And also what you were talking about with looking down and feeling like, you know, you're just kind of looking at the square. I think it was Xander, but it might be Cam Smith. I can't remember who it was. One of them I noticed was putting a dot on like the back of the ball. Because I have this problem sometimes, too, where, like, I'm looking down at the ball, but I don't really know what I'm looking at. Like, you're just kind of, like, you're just kind of looking there, but there's no real focus. I'm thinking about the hole. So he put this, I think it was Xander, put a little dot on the back of his ball where he's trying to make impact. 
And then he just locks in on that number, which almost turns it into a little bit more of the basketball thing where you're you're looking at what you're trying to kind of like make impact with. So it kind of focuses your eyes. I'm going to give that a try. I'm playing in a member guest this weekend, and I am definitely going to try that. That makes sense because, I mean, of course, whenever you talk about this golf stuff, it makes sense. You get out there on the range or on the course and three or four attempts in, you're doing something completely different. But it is... There's times like playing yesterday, I played Pioneers number 10 with a great crew that I do yeah, want to talk Clint about. Yeah, Clint Dempsey, but fucking Clint soccer Dempsey, legend. Who is, such a, who is such a legend. He's got like, he's a little bit quieter with this great dry sense of humor, absolute competitor. Johnson Wagner, who's obviously been doing all kinds of stuff with Golf Channel. He's at the players right after Scotty got that up and down. He was out there. He's like hitting shots of the greens all over the Masters tournament. And then Chris Lane, which if you're a country musician, big, big plans is one of his massive songs. And I'm a huge country guy. So I've known him for a while, played a bunch of golf with him. So it was a great crew at number 10. But there were times out there where I'm trying to learn with my with my full swing uh, something similar to my routine with my putting. Because like you said, even though people should have my putting, it's the best part of my game. I make a lot of putts, or at least I feel like I'm I'm like. Uh, around my handicap or better than my handicap with my putting, whereas my swing can sometimes be a nightmare and my go- and my ball striking. So I'm trying to develop a routine in a consistent way that I approach putting because over putting, I think about nothing. I go through a pretty standard routine that I could even look at clips and I would say like it would probably be down to within a second or two between when I start like addressing a putt and when I hit the putt almost every time subconsciously I've just built in this routine. I feel comfortable. And I sort of black out when I putt. I don't even know what I think about. I usually putt it pretty decently, and that's that. Whereas the golf swing, every single attempt is like a completely isolated incident where I'm thinking, I'm thinking about a ton of stuff. I have no routine. Trotty shits on me for it all the time. He's like, you have no com- like, um, committed and comfortable routine with your swing. He's like, I could tell you're, when you're nervous with the driver, you rush, you step right in to the tee shot, and you kind of just swing. And I and and you know, looking at that from my angle, I know, and I noticed it yesterday where like there were times where I was looking down at the ball. It was within half a second to two seconds away from when I'm going to pull the club back. And in my head, I was saying, I don't even know what I'm trying to do right now. I don't like, and then I'm almost like not even focused on the golf ball. I'm like, where's the golf? And then next thing you know, like I'm swinging a seven iron and anything could happen. And sometimes it's good, but sometimes it's horrific or you chug it, whatever. And right afterwards, I'm like, you just like when they say you're not committed to the shot, not only was it not committed, I didn't even know what I was doing. Like for a second, I just was like, oh, it's my turn. Pace of play. Everyone's looking at me now. I'm going to hit the ball. Ah, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, fuck me. So I'm trying to get more of a routine down. And, you know, one thing that that Trotty actually helped me with with my driving and why I could do it pretty well in the range was he's like, you know, and just, he's like, mate, I want you to just hit the golf ball with your driver. He's like, don't think about what you're trying to do with the top are your hands too high are you trying to take it away he's like just literally in the same sense that if you handed a five-year-old a golf club for the first time and you said just just hit this ball into the air he's like i would just want you to do that just literally hit the golf ball in the air you've learned enough about the swing that your swing fundamentals are close enough and we could tweak some stuff but just like hit the golf ball and it's amazing when you do that that like how much better you strike it and how much more consistently it comes out it might go a little left might go a little right but like you just kind of hit it pretty pretty pure when you do that yeah i think it's one of the reasons why like alcohol helps a lot of people be better at golf oh, it just it just time. slows or like when you're when you're you know five beers deep or you know a couple fireball birdie shots deep like you don't you're not thinking about the position at the top you're just like you're you're, you're almost have this like i'm gonna show off mindset of like i'm gonna i'm gonna hit this and then i'm gonna talk shit and then when, when you have that you have that positive mindset going into the ball and you're not thinking about everything that can go wrong it is a serious concern of mine that we talked about it. Alcohol is an enormous contributor to my best golf game. And it's, yeah. it's, I'm trying to now reach a point where it's not required for me to play like B or B plus or higher golf. And now it's almost to the point where it's like, if I'm struggling and I haven't started drinking, I know that when I get two or three drinks deep, I'm going to play at least B golf for me, which is like in play hitting at a decent distance, hitting the ball close to properly, and I'm, I'm there, I'm playing golf. Whereas, like, I really don't want that to be the case, but currently it's the case. That is, that's literally just the deal right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. I mean, I know that this weekend, I, I feel like, you know, member guests, you kind of get a little bit of a pass because it's like drinking is sort of part, part and parcel. Totally. And my partner is, 
just had a baby and this is his first like real trip away and he's already texting me like what are we drinking for breakfast so i know it's going to be sort of one of those weekends um but yeah no it's I've which is great with it before yeah i'm a huge fan no, of that it's, it's great time, it's gonna be a lot like... of fun but i don't i don't think he has his mind on the prize i don't think he's really thinking about winning <laughs> which is kind of a which is kind of a problem uh a couple announcements here we got a bunch of stuff coming up so i'm wearing this shirt right now pga championship that's the next major on the calendar it's coming up in a month uh we've got merchandise so we've got pga gear right here as you can see i got other shirts but the back of this is Good louisville a little bourbon action a little bourbon a little louisville then we've got another one uh this is gonna be friday all right friday i believe noon eastern uh time store.barstoolsports.com we're gonna have pga barstool golf merchandise available this is a valhalla hole right here this is the kind of one of the, the famous one the island green situation and then, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Louisville, but it's a kind of derby town. Big derby town. I used to go to the derby in college every year. Is that right? That's yeah, awesome. yeah. It was, it was like a seven-hour drive from Chicago, and th there would be like party buses, and we would go, and it, you know, oh, you're in the infield. It was unbelievable. Derby and fantastic. Indy 500. That's, we took, a, took advantage of the Midwest. Um, so anyways, we got, we got PGA Championship merchandise. We had it last year at Oak Hill. We've got it this year at Valhalla. Tiger Woods won there at Valhalla. Uh, Rory, did Rory win? Rory won at Valhalla. Rory we won, coming yeah. Seventy second hole, and Phil and Ricky and Rory in the dark, and it had rained, and he hit that tee shot that landed on the bank. It could have gone in the water, but didn't. So a ton of history at Valhalla. That's where Tiger chased it down, I believe, and did the point move. Uh, was at Valhalla. In Bob May, Bob May, nineteen ninety nine, I believe. One of the all time back nine duels in the history of major championship golf i think the two of them shot like 32 or 31 and they both made birdies on the 72nd hole with bob may had this putt from the fringe that was like 10 or 15 feet and he hits it and it looked like it wasn't even close and i believe the announcer said like ah, it just looks like it's not going to be and then it like took the break it caught the hole and went in and then tiger had to make a huge six footer to force a playoff he made it and gave a gigantic fist bump and then the first playoff hole he made that like 30 foot putt that he chased in from from basically the second that he hit the putt chased it in the hole so bahala has got a ton of history we got their logo our logo and some cool designs so friday you're gonna be able to get uh pga championship merchandise it was 2000 not 1999 for everyone's okay. yelling and if you haven't seen there the you know about like the ball going into the and then and then popping out uh, tiger mm -hmm. on 18 mm -hmm. tiger hits this ball way left and it looks to everyone like it's going right into these bushes and then you know obviously didn't have they didn't have as, as the same cameras that they have now so they just have this overhead and it's going into bushes and next thing you know it pops out 20 yards further down the fairway going right and it's like how the fuck did that ball bounce that way and there's all these conspiracies that someone grabbed it and chucked it which you know <laughs> if someone did that and got away with it good for them they 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 started you know quite the run good for them is right yeah that's right so that was i was confused because 1999 he won at Medina I think Medina, is where he won. That's right. He beat Sergio. Yeah. Sergio with the tree, the leg kick. And then 2000, he didn't win the Masters, amazingly. And then he went U.S. Open by 15, uh, Open Championship at St. Andrews by eight, barely wins in Valhalla in that awesome finish, and then comes back around nine months later, wins the Masters tournament uh, with a star-studded leaderboard to kind of lock in the Tiger Slam. And he had won the Players' Championship in 2000. Wow. Dude, he birdied he birdied 17 and 18 to get into that playoff. Unbelievable. <laughs> I remember he got up and down. It was like a testy six-footer downhill. Yeah, you should go back and watch the highlights of that. It was an epic, epic major. All-time finish. So we got merchandise stored at barcelosports.com. We're doing an event. So uh, I believe it is going to be Wednesday. Is that Wednesday of tournament week? No, Bushman? I think it's Monday. I think it's Monday. Monday of tournament week? I'm pretty sure it's Monday. May 13th, 2024 is Monday. So we are doing a uh, scramble, I think is what it is. It's called the Derby City Duel. Very cool logo. We're going to have that go on sale. So Monday of PGA Championship Week in Louisville, we're going to be at the Woodhaven Country Club, which is also where we're doing the Barstool Classic. Stop that bad boy. Two-man scramble, a two-person scramble. Two-person scramble then. Women, um, women are encouraged, not just welcome, encouraged to sign up. Anyone's welcome. However you identify yourself, you're welcome to the event. Two-person, two-human uh, scramble is what we're going to call it. And uh, we're going to have a great time. Those are always really fun. They're more one-offs. We get kind of trophies for usually first, second, third. There's some prizes. 
Barstool Classic's pretty serious. You know, I mean, it's fun. Don't get me wrong. Truly, we have a great time. But it's a little more serious in the sense that the stakes are higher. If you win the Barstool Classic at the end of the day, you get $20,000. If you finish in the top four, you almost get like a free vacation to go play a bunch of golf at Greyhawk. So there's a little bit more on the line. These one-off events that we do at the majors and the big events are an absolute blast. We just have such a good time. We're out there drinking, hanging, whatever. It's majors, major championship feels in the air. So we're going to be doing one of those in Louisville on Monday, uh, May 13th. And this Monday, which is going to be April 22nd, that bad boy is going to go on sale. So we'll have the link out for all that, but just putting that on your radar. Did you know that Bill Burr is coming here to Phoenix, Arizona, the Arizona Federal Theater, April 25th, which is next week? You can get Bill Burr tickets for $42 on Game Time on the old Game Time app. You, when, it's very rare that someone goes to a live event and they say, you know what? I wish I just sat home. <laughs> that's just, that's true. The live events are the whole reason that life's worth living. It's why you work. Yeah. It's why you do your nine to five. It's why you do whatever the hell you do. It's to go to events, to live life out there. Game time is the best place to do it. They are the official ticketing partner at Barstool Sports. Finding tickets for less has never been easier than game time makes it. They got flash deals for sudden discounts, zone deals for when you're feeling flexible. And their lowest price guarantee means that if you can find the same seats for less anywhere else, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Game Time is the best place for last minute seats with up to 60% off your favorite events. What are you waiting for? We've got all kinds of hockey playoffs coming up. I love the playoffs. So, any city that we're in when we're traveling that's got a team that's still alive, you can just pull up Game Time, find a great deal, and go to the game. You can go to any concerts, comedy whatever it might be, sports, they've got it on Game Time. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. Use the code 4, F-O-R-E, for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Download the Game Time app today. Last-minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed on Game Time. Videos. We got videos out right now. So we did... I think these are our final couple of videos from Stream Song. This is a little bit more of us playing our own ball. We did a fun challenge that's out right now on our uh, on everywhere on all platforms, but where we had basically different guys play different tees based on their handicaps. So we had Trotty played the tips, myself and Frankie played the blues, Francis played like the whites, and then Trent played the forward tees. No strokes, and we just saw who won. Uh, There's a little bit of a lead change. Late, it kind of came down to the stretch. It was a great battle on Stream Song Blue, which was my favorite course there, Tom Doak course. Uh, and then we've got uh, kind of the foreplay important tournament that we're calling, where everybody's not, played not a major, ball. just important tournament. That's just it's just an important tournament. I don't, you know, that it's a pretty good description. Uh, we played the blue tees, I believe, all of us. It was blowing like 25 to 35 miles an hour, and it's the hardest course there. Uh, significantly. The front nine has a ton of trouble on Stream Song Red. And so it was a little bit of a circus, uh, but it was a battle for the first ever important tournament title. And again, everybody playing their ball, the whole deal, kind of the conclusion of the Stream Song series. So that bad boy's coming out, I think, on Thursday, Bush? When's that coming out? We're doing when, uh, part one's Wednesday. Part two is the following Tuesday. So that's next week? Yeah, the first one's next week, and then the following week after that is part two. All right. So that's what we got going on with the old um, uh, video situation. Okay. A bunch of stuff I want to get into. Um, we'll start with Roy McIlroy. I've gotten into this with you before, Dan, because like the tiger, no sex thing. That kind of drove me crazy because I was like, that's just, that's just a story that every single sports media outlet platform whether you're a podcast whether you're uh a a internet show a tv show a radio show almost everybody talked about that including us we weighed in on that and that's just a quote that's attributed to basically nobody it's just like an anonymous friend of tiger woods that that juicy little one sentence of like he's even given up sex is everywhere and even to this moment people are making jokes about like oh he should have sex again because on the weekend he couldn't do it and i don't know that there's a single ounce of truth involved in that and there's no way there's no discernible evidence that one should believe that's true at all and now here we've got once again yesterday morning rumors started to go all over the place that Roy McIlroy was in serious talks with Liv 
He'd been offered $850 million to go to live and that he was seriously considering it. And within minutes, Rory just did a driving range chat with Todd Lewis, who I love from Golf Channel, great professional, uh, and was like, yeah, nope, I, you know, I've never had an offer ever from Liv, and I'll be playing the rest of my PGA Tour career and the PGA Tour with like a kind of a little laugh being like, yeah, this is so ridiculous that I have to even talk about this. Right when I heard it, I texted a few people, um, and everyone said, I, I, t I texted Shane Lowry, uh, I texted Harry Diamond, his caddy, all of them were like, I would be stunned. But the, but but I think everyone is afraid to say it's definitely not true because the ROM situation, you yeah. know, like it's just very hard to definitively say no. And if you put your neck out and say, you know, this is not true and, it, and then it comes out to be true, you look like a real idiot. I mean, I heard I heard something similar uh, about Shane and I was like, yeah, because it was, you know, there, there was a lot of chatter last week in the media center about Rory and about Shane Lowry. Also, I heard it was like a done deal. And I texted Shane, wow. and, and it was the same thing. And it was like, this is just completely false. I don't know where this is coming from. And so, yeah, I, 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 you know, people were comparing it to the Rom situation, but R Rory, Rom's criticisms of Liv were like a two out of ten. Rory literally said, "I would rather retire than play live golf." He said, "I hate Liv." He said, "I hate what it's done to the game." He literally started a league, the Indoor Golf League (TGL) with the PGA Tour. He is second in the grants, the equity grants, behind only Tiger Woods. He is very close friends with Jay Monahan. If you talk about the boys club or the insiders club, you're usually talking about the U.S. Ryder Cup team. But there is sort of an insider squad on the, on the PGA Tour, and Rory is the face of that, right? Like, he's right. the most, the prince of Ponte Vedra. Rom never felt that way. And I think it was one of the reasons why he went. He, you know, he felt like they kind of... Mark didn't market him the right way. You know, his rap was kind of this angry guy. It's flipped a lot in recent years. And then, I, you know, I think after, after June 6th, it's crazy how that is just not January 6th, but June 6th, it, he, yeah, I mess he that up openly... Every time. I mess that up yeah. every time. I get nervous it's about crazy. it. I'm like, am I... Yeah. People are going to think I'm talking about a potential insurrection of the United States of America when I'm just talking about two golf leagues coming together? I don't know. Yeah, so it's... Uh, after June 6th, I mean, Rom was like open, like, I, you know, it was a betrayal, whereas Rory has been like... You know, I still think he's the right guy. Facts change. We all have to come together. So it would have been the biggest hypocrite move in the history of the world. And it wasn't true. And I feel bad for him that it, that it came out that, you know, because it I don't know if it tarnished his reputation, but he's done everything you could possibly do. Like he's he's said everything right. And the, these rumors still move around. And there is if people haven't watched The Dissident on I think it's Amazon Prime. But the, it's about it's really about the Khashoggi situation, but it goes into the Saudi apparatus. And like there literally are like farms of people who start rumors and start conversations online with the with the intent of just starting shit. And I think that's where this came from. I don't, I, I don't think it came from anyone credible, because unless you think Rory is lying through his teeth that he's never had an offer from live, it's simply made up. It's wild that 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 stuff carries so much weight now. And I don't see it ever reversing because yeah. you know the way that you used to only really consume news was either television radio newspaper and all of those were pretty well vetted through something to a degree of like editorial uh responsibility that you sort of you believed whoever was putting it out there at least truly believed it and had done some version of research or um, sourcing to come up with that information on some level. And then the only other way was just pure rumor, right? <laughs> like like the, the telephone game kind of where things just get changed and you can hear it that way. Nowadays, literally anybody can put anything out there. Like it, anybody can. And it's so tricky because if that gets picked up by the right people and there's a lot of these accounts, like we talk about how we'll get into it with some of the live golf accounts. I mean, Zyre Golf. I mean, not to be a dick, but they post anything that's going to get clicks. Like they did that whole thing. Did you yeah. see that thing about Zach Johnson where there yeah. was like this story about like, that's probably not fucking true. Yeah, no, I a hundred percent. And it's, it's, it's when someone random that has no real, hasn't built up any credibility, put something out there and then it no gets face. picked up by a big account. Then instantly it's like, it, it, you've got thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people. That just believes something because we're headline culture now. You don't click on it and actually see where it's sourced from. You see it 
and within half a second to three seconds, you scroll to the next thing and you have put that into your brain of like, huh, that's interesting. And then you're on to the next thing, which could be some tits popping in your face. It could be a stinger, some guy. It could be anything, but you're like, huh, Rory's going to live 850 million. That's interesting. And then you're on to the next thing and you're texting your group text being like, how about Rory? Right. That's crazy. And like, you, there's no process to slow that down. That just is what it is. It's out in the universe. Thank God Rory happened to be, you know, there, there's an event. He happens to be on the range. He's able to just clear it up right away because otherwise for days and days and days, if he's just home with Poppy and with his family and doesn't really respond or say anything, that's just out there in the universe. And most people are going to believe it. And even if he did come out then in a week or two, everyone would file that away as like, oh yeah, Rory did have an $850 million offer. He was considering it. But ultimately after a few weeks, he, it looks like he said no. When in reality, he's like, I don't even know what they're talking about. I've never gotten an offer. And that's just out in the universe. And it's, man, it's a tricky world where people in, in golf, it's, it's funny because it's very meaningless. It's fucking golf we're talking about. Who's going to play for what league? It really, in our world, it matters. But this goes on in the, the, the much more important stakes in what's going on between, you know, Hamas or Gaza or what's going on in Ukraine or what's going on in our election. Like the same shit happens with a much more forceful effort because you could truly sway public opinion global opinion on international affairs and that if they could do it on that level look how fucking easy it is for people to do it on this level which is just which pro golfer is going to go play where yeah and and the the story i was talking about about zach johnson would basically claim it was some i think it was like a reddit post someone just said they were at on the 12th tee which no way of verifying that <laughs> right the 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 username there's no picture right there's no there was no like name attached. It was some anonymous Reddit account said I was on the 12th tee and people were like really giving Zach Johnson a hard time about his Ryder Cup captaincy. And it's like, if you've been to the Masters, the odds of that happening are just zero. There's just no way that the crowd is like talking shit to Zach Johnson. I mean, maybe if it was like Phil right after the Saudi comments came out, but like no one in that moment is being like, Zach, you pussy, like, you know, this that, and the other. So it's tough. But I will say, you know, like Rory did put an end to it. And that's kind of when my perception of rom started to flip was when there was so much out there and he didn't deny it right like that's when you know yeah. like so yeah, Ro yeah, yeah. yeah so rory did it rory did a very good job of, of you know putting it into it kind of nipping it at its bud but if he didn't say anything then it would have then you would have started to and that's kind of how it went with rom it was like there was there were these kind of nameless accounts and then he didn't respond and then some of the guys the european guys who were a little bit more plugged in with live like the james court like the guardian um independent those guys started to report it and then it started to have legs but this never even got to that level it's tough because people could do this to us incredibly easily on our level on our much more minimized level of like notoriety and it is the caveat of like putting it the way that this reddit user put this and the, there's one thing in there that i laughed at that was almost so i almost appreciated this fake story whoever created this completely fake story putting this little nugget in there because this nugget was in my opinion like the uh whatever kfc does with the ruth canter like this was clearly a little nugget in there that made it obvious it wasn't true where they said uh at the end of it he goes <laughs> there were kids in the crowd and one asked what's that mean what's fuck mean thanks zach and i thought yeah. that was that in my opinion was this person saying like clearly this is fake but when you start something off with i was there on hole 12 uh for zach johnson's fuck off moment at the masters i was one of the survivors here's what happened if you even say like, I actually was, I was at the airport and, uh, I, you know, I ran into Matt Fitzpatrick was at the gate next to me and he was a total dickhead. Like anyone could just say that. And if you preface it with something that seems like a realistic, normal encounter that a normal person would have, you could just bury somebody's reputation easily, easily, easily. And so when I saw this one come up, I was like, man, when they, whoever wrote it this way knows what they're doing because they're painting it in a way that a normal human would read that and be like, ha, nobody would make it up this much. Like this is clearly has to be true. They're just sitting there on 12. Unbelievable. Uh, but that little nugget at the end about like <laughs> the little kid said, what's fuck mean? Thanks, Zach. I but he like, didn't hear right. the people who were saying fuck you to Zach on the T, <laughs> right? Like he only heard it when Zach and also if you've been to Augusta, the 12th green is so far in the distance. And the only reason that anyone even heard the him say fuck off was because there's a mic on the green 
It's not like he's yelled it across 160 yards. <laughs> There's literally zero <laughs> percent chance that that happened. This uh, guy goes, this poor right. Some that I recall where Urban Meyer is a better coach than you. You couldn't coach a WNBA team. Your swing is weird. Typically, that's not okay at Augusta, but this is Zach Johnson, so it was fine. So I also am like, whoever's actually reading this and thinking that that, that happened, I mean, come on. Like I said, I get the beginning of it kind of loops you in a little bit. Like, oh, this guy was there, but a lot of those nuggets are preposterous, and it does. It sucks that people could just make shit up. The most prestigious golf courses in the country have trusted Imperial with the design of their headwear for over 100 years. They remain the number one headwear in golf today. I'm rocking an Imperial rope hat right here. Dan's got one on. It was my hat for the Masters week. You know, you, you form a bond with a hat. You know, if it's uh, this is this is my Masters 2024 hat. It's navy. I wear a lot of navy, so it's going to be coming with me. I, they, they've got everything. I, I love Imperial. Hat. Yeah, the Piner's one. Exactly. Another one I picked up, you know, you just can't help yourself. You got the classic putter boy there. I picked up this Imperial Pinehurst rope hat. Um, they've got original styles. They include uh, the iconic high crown tour visor. Uh, they've also got the proud partnership of the PGA of America, PGA Tour, LPGA, USGA, and is the official headwear of the AJGA. Licensed collections made in partnership with these organizations are available on their site. They include styles with event logos for the WM, Phoenix Open, the Players' Championship, President's Cup, the 2024 U.S. Open, 2024 PGA Championship, and much more. And also, Imperial knows custom hats. Customers can mix and match to design your own or upload a logo of your choice to custom.imperial1916.com to order custom Imperial headwear. They've got no minimums, quick turnaround times, and free shipping. Shop all of Imperial's collections today at imperial1916.com. Use the code BARSTOOL to get 20% off your first order and be on the lookout for Barstool Golf Imperial Headwear coming to your local pro shop very soon. That is imperial1916.com. Use the code BARSTOOL for 20% off. Speaking of John Rahm, there was a big narrative going around, sort of a takeaway from last week, that John Rahm was kind of giving all the signs uh, that he's pretty irritated, disappointed. I don't want to go as far as say like regretful, um, but you know, in, in the state of things since his move to live, that he looked incredibly uh, disinterested and flustered during the entire ceremony. Obviously, after you, uh, you know, you you finish up, you don't win the Masters as a defending champion. You clean up, you come back, you got to be there to present the jacket. You're in Butler Cabin, you got to be there and present the jacket again on the practice screen where they do the whole thing. And that John Robb just, in general, didn't look uh, thrilled to be there. I don't know anybody who would be like, thrilled to be there, but you kind of put on a thing, whatever. That combined with his comment saying, yeah, you know, I really kind of thought when he went in December that by this time, you know, we'd probably have something figured out. All of that kind of gave credibility to most people's theory that. Rom figured he would be the tipping point. He would sort of tip the scales to the point where PGA Tour would be forced to do a deal with Liv. He would be kind of the last guy to really get a payday, and then they're all going to end up playing in the same place anyway. So why wouldn't you do that? Whereas now, and and there's you know you got to understand the guys on Golf Channel who I do love. I, I'm very good friends with a couple of them, but they clearly are as a, about as anti Liv as anyone on earth. Uh, they're biased. You know, they have a, they have a, they have a big deal biased. with the PGA Tour. Like they're, that's they're we definitely, just have even to, if they yeah. don't, you know, believe that they're biased. It's in there. Everybody knows that it's in there. And so uh, they're kind of saying, "Hey, look, like it looks to me like John Rahm he's out there. He's playing in front of a couple people in Saudi Arabia. He's playing against, or he's playing, you know, a couple Muni courses. He's playing in events that." Uh, some obviously have more juice than others, but they're not what the Players' Championship was this year. The Players' Championship this year was insane. We talked about it, one of the most fun tournaments to watch that I can recall in recent memory with the uh, the leaderboard down the stretch with Xander and Wyndham and Scotty and the fact that Wyndham lipped out that putt on the 72nd hole. They got to play the Island Green. It was must-watch TV. The atmosphere was off the charts. That event was so cool, and that PJ Tour events in general kind of carry this prestige, and they carry this this like almost uh, nervousness when you get there of the energy because it means a lot, whatever. And that John Rahm lives for that fucking shit. He's such a historian of the game. He's such a legacy driven guy that for him to then be playing in these live events 
and not be playing any of these PGA Tour events, for him to then get out there at the Masters, see how much he truly enjoys to be in that competition, to not be playing as well, clearly not happy with his game, and then to be leaving the Masters and being like, now nah, I just kind of go back to like relative obscurity. And I mean that from a viewership standpoint. You know, the PJ Tour events have millions of viewers, even if they're pretty low and not doing overly well. The live events have like a couple hundred thousand viewers. So it's clearly like a fraction of the viewers, a fraction of the crowds. And so a lot, a lot of this narrative was that John Rahm was showing a ton of signs over the last week of just being clearly disappointed by kind of where this decision has led him thus far. Yeah, I think you know, I, I, part of the issue is is when when you go to live and I, this is not I'm not this is not I'm not saying this should be the case, but you're basically going to be judged by how you do in four tournaments a year. Yeah. Because even if you play well on live, the narrative is going to be okay, let's see how he does in the majors when he's playing against all the best players, 72 holes, you know, 140 person fields, and he just had one of those four go by and he did nothing. And you know, he finished whatever, 35th, whatever it was. And so now, yeah, you're right. He goes back and and I think he knows that like his next chance to cement his legacy, which he cares a lot about. I mean, I don't, you never saw Brooks saying, you know, not, not being at the Waste Management Phoenix Open was hard. Like, or DJ, you know, with, it was another conversation. I think DJ might be like all the way, you know, just over it all. Just checked out, but, just fully yeah. checked out. But like, and he did win a live event, so who knows? But yeah, true. You know, I, you never really saw those comments from a lot of the guys who went They, you know, they said, I, I'm, I'm happy with my decision, this, that, and the other, you know, I, we're growing the game around the world. Rom, you know, he lives in Scottsdale. You know, he loves Riviera. He loves the history of the game. And I think he knows that his next chance to, to, to add to that is in a month. And, you know, he's, I'm sure he'll, he'll be looking forward to, to Louisville and looking forward to a chance to prove that he still is one of the best players in the world, but he's going to, you know, he's number four in the world right now. He'll probably be like number 10 or number eight when that comes around. And you you just you only really have four chances to prove yourself to the massive golf watching audience. Um, and he missed one of those. I do think for sure that he thought that there'd be a deal by now. I think we all thought that. Remember, it was the end yep. of the year was the was the uh, deadline. And then it was by the Masters that came and went. And we asked Tiger about it after his round on Sunday. And and I I, I thought his answer was very telling. The question was, you know, what, I love what were you your we. I love that you said we. It's yeah, crazy. It's yeah, impressive. you're impressed. Yeah, That's, of course. And uh, yeah. And he said, um. They said, you know, what were your impressions of Yasser and, and do you feel like you're closer to a deal? And he said, you know, it was a positive meeting. I wouldn't say we're, you know, I don't know if we're closer to a deal, but we're moving in the right direction. And that's kind of been the line. And again, you know, these things happen behind closed doors, but the Masters came and went. The end of the year came and went. You know, I just don't know that this thing is really going to come together that soon. And and if you told Rom, I mean, surely he would have made this decision. If you're making a decision that big, you have to consider all outcomes right one outcome being this deal happens in a week and that's the best case scenario i think for him and and it's funny how all these live guys left and now they're saying oh we all need to come back together it's like yeah well because then you win both you get you get your cake and you eat it too that would be the best possible scenario but surely he would have run the thought experiment of this doesn't come back together right like surely that would have been a part of his calculus i think so but i also think you know he's a very emotional guy right he's yeah fired up when he's excited he's rattled and, and pissed when he's upset like he's a very emotional guy and i could just see him going through you know i i think being at this point now was predictable almost nothing could have happened where they wouldn't be in the same spot we're at now but i think total speculation this is a speculation friendly show always has been <laughs> always will be i just think there's a part of him and and again if i'm just purely guessing there's part of him that is probably concerned that he might have three or four years of this and that for a guy who week in and week out like you said like he wants to win he wants to win at Riviera he wants to win at these iconic tournaments he wants to win Mirfield Jack's tournament Arnold Palmer uh you know the 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 big events that have this prestige that have decades and decades of history that cement his legacy he knows exactly where he stands when it comes to Spanish golfers he always goes into all that history and for, like you said, for him to now be pretty limited in that chase to four events of the year, four majors, if you don't bring it in a couple of them, he really has a couple events a year that he gets up for in the sense of the way that he really likes to get up for stuff. Uh, I think that that outlook for him, you know, could be something that a guy like him, I could see being like, fuck me. Like, I don't know that it, you know, yeah, the money's incredible. I, I took it for the money, but I don't 
on a day in day out for a guy that lives to compete and drive and try to be the best player in the world and try to be the best Spanish golfer in history. I, I think there's a part of him that's probably like, fuck me, man. And you know what's happened since he went? Scotty's happened. And yeah. that's changed the dynamic. Scotty is such a clear number one right now. He won the Players' Championship. He won Bay Hill. He won the Masters Tournament. There's no even, um, I think it was Bryson, we were in the press room asking him, and he said, yeah, you know, I haven't had the chance to, to go against Scotty, and I really want to test myself against the best player in the world. Scotty is such a clear number one, and he's just not playing in live events. And so right. no matter what happens in a live event, the golf public's going to be like, well, well, the guy who's clearly the best player is not there. And in the tournaments, when you got to play against him, you got dusted. He, he killed you. Yeah. So it's, I think Scotty being a huge number one and playing on the PGA Tour has, has kind of increased the, the, at least the narrative gap as far as the competitiveness. That's a great point because it is the asterisk thing that Taylor Gooch said is ironically enough flipping the other way dramatically of, you know, you almost, you're right. There's a huge asterisk. If you win any live event, it's like, well, the clear guy that's better than everyone wasn't there. So it's like, no, no matter what, you know right away, like, well, yeah, you, know, you didn't beat the best guy because the one time you went up against him, like you said, he killed everybody. And the Scotty thing, Max Homa, I saw his interview, uh, and he, one of his quotes, he said, the gap seems to be quite large right now. And we haven't heard something like that in a long time since somebody like Tiger Woods and Max, in clear fashion, was incredible about it. He was very thoughtful about it. But he was going through and essentially saying, like, he's like, I don't know how you can't say that the gap is very large because the guy won at Bay Hill, an incredibly difficult golf course that requires all kinds of certain shots. Going with away. A, with a wild crowd and a leaderboard where people were there. He won that pretty handedly. And then he came out, his next start, the Players' Championship, the biggest tournament that we've had all year outside of the Masters with an incredible finish and dramatics and treacherous shots all over, and he just won. And then you go to the first major, that is the biggest golf tournament in the world, and he goes in with all this pressure. He's a shocking betting favorite to a, a level that we haven't seen in a long, long time, plus 450, and he wins. And Max was just like, it's, you know, and they kind of asked him, like, is it, demoralizing or is it challenging or is it inspiring and he was like no it is it is inspiring he's like it's definitely challenging he's like he the way that he could just hit the ball is is a problem and he's like but it's challenging it's like i you know you want to beat somebody at, at, who's playing their best and you want to try to prove that you could be the best player in the world and he very clearly is he's very clearly a pga tour guy and yeah you only get four chances to go up i think that the number was like the closest live guy to Scotty was nine shots back. Now, I mean, that's a little bit whatever because the closest guy in general was four shots back, who uh, who was Oberg, who finished second. So it's like everybody was many shots back. But, yeah, that guy's clearly the best player, and he's playing on the PGA Tour. And I think that's that's kind of flipping that original Taylor Gooch quote. Ron wants to play against him. Yeah. He, he, he definitely does. If you're, if you're a guy who's, you know, he's got two majors. Scotty's got two majors. Uh, Rom, I believe is he's like my age, so he's 29. Scotty's 27. Like he wants to go toe to toe with that guy more than just four times a year. I thought it was really funny, you know, Max. That's the right. That's the kind of the the what the right way to handle it. They asked Fitzy. Uh, on I think it was uh Colt Nose. He had him on the show and the most classic like Northern English crake answer. They go, you know, how impressive is it? He goes, it's not impressive. It's annoying. <laughs> like you know, and then he was like, yeah, you know, he's just so good. He's so good. But he was there. They are talking about him now in a way that people haven't really talked about another golfer just because of the gap. And even when, even when Rom was doing it last year, Scotty was there. Scotty was still there. You know, he was, he was maybe not as he didn't win the masters like Rom did, but he was really close. And right now there's, there's no clear number two. And you can't say it's Rom because you just, there's just not enough. There's just not enough recent data to suggest that there is no clear number two. There's like five guys that I would put in a tide for second. Number one. I mean, Xander Shoffley is number three in the world right now. And like he, you know, he hasn't won anything. Right, right, yeah. I uh, I love the move, Scotty. Sunday night when the video or the pictures emerged of him at his local local pub, he's in there with the green jacket and the staff, and he was still in his peach shirt. And the, <laughs> I loved that. I thought that was amazing. That was kind of we needed that because right because there's people that were bitching a little bit about he's boring and Scotty's so good but pretty reserved and it's just kind of boring. I thought that added a little a little flavor, a little color to like kind of Scotty and his whole deal, and so. 
I loved seeing that. I thought people kind of received that well of like, okay, this guy's got a local pub. He doesn't just go home, sit in the kitchen and play Scrabble with Meredith. Like he goes to his local <laughs> pub. That's nice to see. So I love that. And then I'm stunned he's playing this week at the RBC Heritage. I think a lot of people are, I guess. The due date is still a week or two away, right? Otherwise, there's no I, way he's playing this week. I tweeted this, and I got some hate, but it was like, th- th- like he's not even, like, yeah, this baby might not be born until fucking PGA. <laughs> you know what I mean? It might, now it'll yeah. probably come tomorrow, but it was like, that was almost another thing where it was just like, you can ask anybody. If your wife was going into labor, and you know, it's like, well, she's not going into labor, so I'm going to leave it. You know, I'm going to say what the right answer is. So, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. I don't know, but it's gonna, it, is, it is interesting that, like, the best run that we've seen since Tiger, now statistically, Data Golf has all the numbers to back this up. There's a massive variable that's coming in the picture, and it's Baby Scheffler. And yep. I know that like guys have, you know, some guys have slipped, and some guys haven't when they've had a baby. And I asked Max about this, and you know, he said it hasn't really changed. Or I asked Spieth about this this week, and he's got two kids now. I think Bill Simmons said that the first the first kid is the ACL, and the second kid is the Achilles. So I asked <laughs> him about having two kids, and he said, you know, you just got to be kind of cognizant with your time he's got a massive change coming into his life and it's going to be fascinating to see what impact if any impact that has on his game because if he starts to he's gonna we talked about this in the last show this isn't going to be forever and if it if it drops off later this year the narrative is going to be that the baby impacted that even whether it was the baby or not it's a great point it really is right now yeah it does almost seem like, Scotty, don't change anything, dude. Don't change anything about your life for five years. And this is a major, major change. Major he, change. He uh, he had a good quote during his post-round presser, too, where he said, he's like, you know, when you get married, a lot of people make the joke of, like, your life is over. Enjoy your last couple weeks of freedom, the whole deal. He's like, when you have your first or a child, universally, everyone is like, it's the best thing that ever happens in your life. And he was like, so we're very much looking forward to it. And I, I thought that was a very... A good observational line from him of he's like everyone says it's the best thing ever and changes your life for the better so uh we'll see we'll see how that affects him but right now he's unstoppable the fact that he's just playing again this week i i have to throw a little bit of money on him on dk partner DraftKings. and speaking of DraftKings, i've placed a wager for the first women's uh major championship of the year it's the chevron this weekend nelly corda has won a shocking four golf tournaments in a row i didn't really realize this i was reading through some of the uh some of the uh, preview stuff today that she won um, the drive on, I believe is, is what it's called down in Orlando, which we've been to a few times. She took a she big w- break. She won that. She took seven weeks off, seven weeks off, and then came back and has won four straight, three after the break, one before. So she's won four straight LPGA tour starts their first major of the year. She finished third at the Chevron last year. Uh, I did see that it has been. Since Lydia Ko's 2016 A&A Inspiration was the last time any player who was number one in the, in the Rolex Women's World Rankings won a major championship. So it's not an easy thing to do. Wow. And it's been eight years since that happened. That's a crazy stat. She's on a killer run. She's plus 550 on um, DraftKings Sportsbook. So I saw that. It just feels like it's that time. feels like with Scotty and with her that like the odds are so crazy because they're so dominant. And I'm going Nelly this week. That's kind of, for me, the storyline of the week. It would be five straight LPGA Tour victories for one player. It would be just vaulting this, you know, young, marketable American female golfer even higher into stardom. It would be, I think, only her second major championship. She won yeah. at, I think, Couple Atlanta years Athletic ago. Three years ago. Yeah. And so uh, I'm just all in on Nelly. I ho- it's good for the women's game, I think, if she wins. The storylines will be good. I think it would even make, you know, like Scott Van Pelt would have to say a little something about it. I think if she wins five in a row and wins the major. So I'm rooting hard for Nelly and because it'll be good for my uh, my DraftKings account. One big difference. The, the odds are similar with her and Scotty. Scotty was 450. She's 550. There was a bunch of guys like I think Rom was 10 to 1. Rory was 12 to 1. The next closest is 25 to 1. <laughs> In the oh uh, in God. yeah, so she's just like the biggest favorite you could ever possibly imagine. Yeah, I mean, look, we've seen the impact that one one um, woman can make on a sport. Or Caitlin Clark, I mean, but just bodied the Masters ratings, which we should probably touch on. More than double people watched the the final uh, the women's championship than Masters Sunday, and you know, the reason for that is Caitlin Clark. And and you know, you can winning a major as the number one player in the world. You said it doesn't happen very often and, and she's marketable and she's cool and she's funny and she's got this incredible swing. I'm actually going to 
next week they're in LA at the LPGA. So uh, I'll be going to that, which I'm excited about. Ooh. Probably filming a few interviews. And uh, yeah, let's let's hope she does it. I think the women's game, if you if you you know want women's golf to grow, this is a huge huge opportunity. She's just got to shoot the lowest score, seventy two holes. That's it. I uh, yeah, I'm rooting for. Her. I I think it'd be big for the game. And I like Nellie. You filmed a couple of videos with her. She was great. So let's go, Nellie Corda, major women's major. So I know right into the Masters, right from the Masters into the Chevron. Um, so tune into that. Let's get going. Let's ride the Nellie train here and get a win for DraftKings Sportsbook. Um, all right. Masters ratings, like you said, down 20% from last year. I think uh, Rom peaked at 12-something million. It was 9-something million uh, on Sunday. Total viewership or like peak viewership, uh, maybe average Sunday, whatever the hell it was, down to about 20% from last year. A little surprising in my mind. I thought that the Masters leaderboard really for much of the day was fantastic. I thought, you know, the fact that you had Tiger Woods playing and Tiger starts the day, and I feel like clips kind of go around him and, and Vern and the tree. And the whole deal would have got people in the Masters mindset, reminded them that it's going on. And then you've got Scotty, you know, teeing off of the one shot lead, but a bunch of guys right there and guys that are pretty big names in terms of drawing public interest uh, with Max, with Colin, with Bryson, uh, with Oberg, the people from the Ryder Cup remember him. I just would have thought it would have had a similar players' championship type feel and did for the first half of the day. And it wasn't until 12th. 11th 12th holes that the final group got to so for much of the day it was still pretty damn close uh so i i, I was a little surprised and i guess alarmed that the ratings were down 20 percent. yeah yeah i was surprised as well um 20 percent is basically what the pga tour ratings have been down as well um th- which is interesting because the ratings were up e- espn's ratings were up on thursday friday i think it's because tiger was playing decent you know people were watching yep. because tiger was Right. You know, he was even par what he, or one over and, you know, he shot that incredibly impressive even par on Friday and he was kind of still in the mix. So ESPN ratings were up, but CBS ratings Tiger, were down. When Tiger's uh, finishes really early on Sundays like that, they should have him just go play the par three course as well and just occasionally cut, <laughs> just cut to him. Like, they're like Scotty hits his approach on nine and then they're like, oh, here's yeah. Tiger on the third. And he's like trying to get a hole in one on the par three Yeah, course. just bring out, just keep bring out some... Uh, just bring out like uh, every hole. Just bring out someone new. You bring out Charlie for the first hole. You bring out <laughs> Steve Williams for the second hole. You know, you just have like That's the right. Tiger cam. That would be incredible. Just keep him out there. Just like Tiger, yeah. we need to be able to cut to you during the coverage of you playing yeah. golf somewhere. So, yeah, here's Tiger. Here's Roger Federer to play a hole with Tiger Woods. <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was tough. It's tough as down twenty percent, and uh, and I yeah, I don't know if that's um. A result of the fraction in the game, uh, 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 or the fracture in the game, not fraction, fracture in the game. I really don't know what that's a result of, but no bueno, not good. Uh, and hopefully that improves. Um, from the gallery, we got a couple quick from the galleries that we're going to get to. Neil Shipley, low amateur at the uh, 2024 Masters tournament, played with Tiger Woods, the whole deal from the gallery, uh, which we love. Brought to you by our great friends at Fireball Whiskey. Oh, baby, do we love that iconic sediment and flavor? Those 50 milliliter shooters. Dan's got one right there. You pack your bag full of those, or when the cart girl comes around, flag her down and say, we're going to do some shots, get involved. Can we please do a bunch of fireball shots? You can even grab them, throw them in your bag for later if you need to. There's no chaser required. There's no glassware required. There's no real cleanup uh, um, process required. It's just the iconic cinnamon whiskey. It's delicious. It gets everybody going. It ups the ante on the course. You rip them back. You throw those things out, and bang, you're good to go. Shout out to Fireball, who brings you from the gallery. Uh, Jake says, what is your arch enemy hole? The hole that keeps you up at night and smells of double or triple bogey. Seventh hole at Quaker Ridge. I, I, you know, I miss that place a lot. I do not miss the seventh hole. Anyone who's, who's played there knows it's like goes dead right. It, you, know, you kind of have to tee off. You either have to hit like a 230-yard shot or hit a three-wood over the, the trees, and I just hit it out of bounds it's way, way, way too often. And it was one of those holes where you're just like, I had that feeling that you have over the tee where I'm just like, where is this going to go? And you're just excited to that see sucks. it because you just hope you just hope that it's flying straight. Uh, my probably biggest one, you know, I'm going to go to like like you did to the courses I play the most because it's yeah. just, you know, whatever. But it's the first tee on Greyhawks Talon course. And it's infuriating because it is a it's a it's probably a 400 from the back tees. It's probably like a 420 yard hole or something like that. And it's sneaky narrow and looks very narrow so it's like the whole talent course is kind of that way where they've got like the desert shrubbery is just tall enough that you can't really see the fairway but you know it's out there 
and you, you've just hit maybe a couple quick ones on the range. You're going out. You don't know what your ball flight's going to do yet on the course. And there's just a driving range. So it's pretty much dead. Left is all dead. And then on the right, there's like just enough desert that creeps in that's like bushy desert. And it's so easy to just flare one into that right desert. You go over. You have to take like an unplay. Usually find it. You take like an unplayable. Now you're like 200 yards out hitting some shot around like a bushy tree. And you just start the round with a double all the time to the point where I'm almost considering just hitting four iron off that tee just so that I'm like, I can then hit another four iron or whatever the hell it is up near the green chip on. And at least worst case, I'm like, my score is a four and a half on average instead of these just tap in sixes that I make on that hole all the fucking time. Yeah. I, if I ever build a golf course, it, the first hole will be the widest hole in the course because that just, you know, I like that. I feel like at stream song, the first hole one of the first holes is really fucking tricky. One of them is like almost a yeah. drivable par four. The other one is hard. It's the red, which is the video we got coming next week. And it was blowing yeah. Dan 30 miles an hour left to right. And it was like yeah. raining a little bit. And it was a little chill. It was, it was dicey. But, uh, but yeah, that one stands out to me. And then, God, I would also say the 11th tee at Pinehurst number two. If anybody's played Pinehurst number two, the 11th hole is sort of like the tees set you up to hit it at these left bunkers and it, another one where it's like visually it's just almost pete die-esque it like looks like everything kind of blends together i've played there a million times i know what it does it like kind of fairway kind of like slants left like it kind of i wouldn't say slants it sort of angles like almost like the 12th green at augusta it angles like from the left to the right and the greens like it's a slight 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 dog leg right almost kind of a straight hole that just looks like it's dog leg right and i just hit it into the left bunkers or the left like waste area all the time because you just can't. And then from there, it's just a struggle. You end up making a bogey or double all the time. But I would say anyone who's played Greyhawk uh, probably know the hole I'm talking about. It's if you don't, if you don't have an issue with that T ball, then it's a pretty easy hole to start on. But man, it's so easy to stand up there and just flare one into the desert. And then you're just fucked from the very beginning. Uh, and it is funny how that, that mindset over a hole affects every, level to the point where we've had many pga tour pros on who are like oh yeah there's a certain tee shot i have on whatever hole like max homa just couldn't clearly couldn't get comfortable with the 13th tee shot at augusta national he was laying way back he was like <laughs> right. hitting like a little like a little slappy cut and then just laying up which i get and it's it was surprising to me because he was hitting i mean you have you have to hook it more and you can get away with it on 10 but a couple swings earlier he was hitting that rope hook on 10 all week and i'm like dude you pretty much just aim a little bit more right you could hit that same shot it's easy for me to say sitting on my couch but like i can't even hit the fucking first fairway on talon the talent course at greyhawk so i completely get it uh but i thought that was a good question because everybody kind of has those that um that that stack up um or that rattle you in your in your head jeff says what happens to all the balls the pros hit on the range at pga tour events i'm pretty sure they all hit brand new balls of whatever brand model they play and then where the hell do the golf balls go after they've been hit for the week I think that's the whole like secondary premium golf ball market. Isn't there like a whole thing? There's like websites would, that have that. I would kind of guess that as well. There's websites and they have like refurbished this or that where they put a little stamp on there and do it. I would have to guess that's what they do because you can't just clean them and then like, pre like pretend like they're new, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's not going to work. No. And it's like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of golf balls. So they have to do something valuable with those things. But I was wondering like, you think there's any chance they just ship them to the next event? Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if they if they like have like a couple of of events, right? Because you can hit a golf ball more than once, right? Like, are they probably right. reason that week? They might have like a two week cycle or three week cycle, but that's actually an interesting question. We should ask somebody who works like in the, for the PJ Tour and Ops who would actually. That's an interesting answer. I don't know the answer. Yeah, I'm not sure the answer on that one either. We should we could ask the TaylorMade guys too because you know they're kind of on. Yeah, they supply on, it, so they would know. They would probably know that, so we should ask them. But I have absolutely no idea. Um, this is from an anonymous, anonymous, uh, emailer says if live golf were to offer Scotty Scheffler an offer right now, what would that offer be? I mean, I don't know. Cause everyone's going to go off that 850 number that was just made up and, I and know. the tiger and the tiger billion dollar thing was also just like made up. So I think it would probably be similar to Rom, maybe a little bit less because I don't think, you know, maybe I think I don't, yeah, I think 300 million, 400 million, whatever they offered Rom. Kind of what I was thinking as well. He is the clear number one, like you said, that would tip some serious scales. I almost, I was, it got me thinking, because I, 
for whatever reason, Scotty and Rory to me are the two guys that just like would never go. It wouldn't matter. But it made me think like, what if they offered Scotty Scheffler three billion dollars and they're like, you know, like, is he considering it? Like that's so you know, you're one of the richest people in the I like That's everyone so every money. money money means you know money matters a different amount to different people and those two guys are lucky where they have made a gazillion dollars already rom was the same way though but i think rom it wasn't just for the money i do think that there was this like fuck the pga tour fuck jay monahan and i'm gonna bring this whole thing back together i don't think it was just i'm gonna take this money and never see these guys again i don't think he would go either uh you know i just don't think scotty's going i don't think rory are going i think they make a ton of money as is they're very happy with that and they have a clean kinda, image, clean image. Right. Rom, even now, Rom, like I, I have nothing, but like he was a little angsty. Like mm-hmm. you know, there's, there's some, you know, uh, Brandel's talking about how he was bought. You know, like there's that narrative's out there, mm-hmm. right? Where Scotty's got a clean image. I, I like even Max can be. Said in his little uh, reaction to being asked about Scotty. He was like, it's so annoying too because he's like, he's such a great player, he's such a great competitor. And he's like, and he's even a better person, which is infuriating, is what he said about Scotty. So he does have that image. He's the best player in the world. It would just be crazy to mess that up. That's another part of the Rom thing that I think, I, I speculate, sorry, irks him, is that it, it has changed his reputation. Even if it's unwarranted, even a lot of people don't feel as negatively or it wasn't as aggressively negative as it was towards Phil and towards Bryson when those guys went. It still is even a even if it's a couple of degrees more negative than it was before. I think it irks John Rahm that his his reputation has suffered from the from the move. He didn't like. There was a question in the press conference that he didn't like, which was, "Do you think that you're considered more the defending champion or a live golfer?" And he said both, and he didn't like the question. But it is sort of a fair question. Like when John Rahm comes up, one of the first things that pops into people's mind is live golf, and that's just right. because of how divisive it's been. We got to get to the Shipley interview. All right, we're going to throw it now to Neil Shipley, so enjoy this. Uh, Excited to chat with him. Hopefully, we get some good stories. Last week in Augusta really kicked off spring, specifically because golf season is officially here. Finally, this is the time of the year. You can bring uh, beautiful days with a wide range of temperatures. We've seen that all over the place. You might have cool mornings and nights. As always, our friends at Peter Millar are ready with the best pieces to let you enjoy as much of it on the greens as possible. I spent all day yesterday with Peter Millar. We played Pinehurst number 10. It was myself, Clint Dempsey, um, uh, Johnson Wagner, and my good friend Chris Lane, all rocking Peter Millar. We all looked incredibly classy, I must say. We did dinner the night before, threw a Peter Millar hoodie on. The next morning, went and got coffee, threw a Peter Millar pullover on. They just got all the best gear in the world. How was Clint Dempsey's game? I mean, that was like when I started, when I was a kid watching soccer, like it was him and Donovan. They were like one, two solid. I think he was like a course 10 handicap, but he's a competitor. He had, you know, as somebody who's like a 10, sometimes they're kind of just a non threat all day and they post something, you know, whatever he might've had four or five holes that weren't his best, but then the rest of it, he hit a great drive down the middle. He made some clutch putts and he was just kind of a, a athletic threat out there. I mean, we were laughing. It was myself and Chris against, you know, a PGA Tour player and a three-time Winner. World Cup star. So you're yeah. like, all right, like these guys are just athletes and we're not. We're just regular people. But the beauty of that is that all of us can just look incredibly good, perfect, feel comfortable because Peter Millar does it better than anybody else. Pinders number 10 was spectacular. I can't wait to talk about it. I'm going to wait and do that justice on the next show and talk all about my round out there. But their Merge Hybrid Jacket over at Peter Millar perfect for spring days featuring a premium performance fabric that offers lightweight warmth and water resistance the perfect partner for your next round celebrate spring in full swing by heading over to petermillar.com slash foreplay check out the merge hybrid jacket as well as all the rest of their performance outerwear offerings peter millar the official outfitter of the usga that is petermillar.com slash foreplay It was, it was crazy though. It went even, it went really crazy when I got paired with Tiger. Uh, and like the first few rounds, it was crazy, but like my phone really blew up when we found out I was playing with Tiger. So that was pretty funny after I shoot 80. <laughs> Good thing you did, honestly. Did yeah. you make that, you make that double on purpose? Be honest. No, no. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, 
I gotta say that is that's like like I'm looking back. If I make Bogey or get up and down to par, whatever it would have been, um, like it would have been, you know, I was like, you know, other than sweet, but I would have never gotten the amount of attention I got playing with Tiger. Like Tiger is that's kind of the whole. I think that's why this whole thing really blew up is because I was paired with Tiger. Like you know, if that doesn't happen, I'm just kind of just another one of the low you ends that no one too. remembers. You dusted him. Yeah, I did. Well, I mean, you know, he's not playing his best right now, but that was I, think uh, that's I was fun. I think to... that's fair to say. I think that's yeah, fair. To that's say. fair. That's that's an accurate <laughs> yeah. statement. Either that, or everyone else has gotten way better since like, 2006. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Courses have gotten way harder. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's it, man. It's it's nuts. It's the quality of golf right now is silly, especially on the PGA Tour and Corn Ferry. It, it's it's nuts. There's a lot yeah. of really good players. Uh, we're here. We're kind of doing what we do. We're just rolling right into this. We've got Neil Shipley. We kind of did a little thing off the top, a little, a little intro, but anyone who pays attention to golf, like you were just alluding to, you were all over the place, especially Sunday. That's a great point that you make about, you know, like you would have just been the, there's a low amateur every year at the tournament and you would have been the low amateur per usual, but instead you get paired with, with Tiger Woods and you, you know, the whole story from, from Oakmont and your kind of history and how much you, you love the guy. What was your, uh, what was your nervousness level uh, arriving and and approaching the situation on Sunday, knowing you know you're going to be spending four or five hours with with the guy? I was I was a little bit nervous, but I gotta say, it's more excited than anything else because it's felt like a kid on a kid on Christmas morning. I was I was like really psyched and uh, like pumped to get there. Obviously, you know, going up to shake his hand and meet him for the first time. There's some nerves there. It's like, well. Better not like you know screw this up somehow and you know want to leave a good first impression. But um, that was super enjoyable. First tee shot was you know with all those people, it's crazy. I mean, I wish they had an aerial camera of us walking to the tee. At least I haven't seen a view of it. But I mean, it was a- absolute like shit show. Like the amount of people just up near the tee and putting green when we went off, it was unbelievable. Uh, a crazy noticeable difference in terms of the crowds from your first three rounds and your practice rounds to your Sunday round with Tiger Woods wearing his Sunday red? I, absolutely. I mean, it, we were like three or four deep everywhere. Uh, you know, my family had followed um, the first three rounds and all the practice rounds, no problem. They got to see every golf shot, you know, no big deal. And they told me that it was just like really tough to try and find a spot to, you know, see me hit a golf shot up close just because like everyone's rushing near the golf balls to try and see Tiger and you know, they ended up hanging back like 200, 300 yards and watch from there because it's just easiest to do that. I've never been able to watch a round of Tiger Woods at the Masters. Every So every tournament that's not Augusta, we get inside the ropes media. And so it's great. We sit on the tee and watch everything. The Masters, the media, you don't get any special treatment. And so, you know, all these people for the first time, they're always like, oh, I'm going to go watch Tiger play nine holes. It's like, no, no, you're not. No, you're not. Unless you've been hanging by the hanging by the rope. You also had such an, a unique situation of, you were the only amateur to make the cut. So you knew you were going to be low amateur. You're not playing for a paycheck. So there was really no reason to be nervous. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, it's, um, we're just going out there and having a fun Sunday round with Tiger Woods, really. Yeah, like, that's how I kind of approached it. You know, I would have had to do something absolutely ridiculous to sneak into the top. I mean, I, I would have to shoot like 59 to sneak in the top 12 or something. So that's not going to happen out there. Um, so we're just like hanging out and having a good time, really. How much of what was your goal of the week coming in to make, to make the cut, to be the low am? Because Christo was up there on Thursday morning. I, he might have gotten to like three under, and then he kind of made a mess in the end, and, and Hagestad missed it by a few. So was that a kind of relief to see those guys dropping down? Um, you know, I, I'm never rooting against anybody, but uh, when I did see that nobody else was going to make the cut, I was certainly a little bit relieved because I felt like, okay, I got that one out of the way. You know, and, you know, I could kind of move my sights onto other goals, you know, for the weekend. Um, so that was, you know, that was good for me. And I felt really great about myself being low amateur, making the cut. It's really hard to do that. Um, you know, it's hard to make a cut on any level of golf. So especially out there in a major. So that was I, that was definitely um, definitely one of the big goals of the week for sure. So I I asked Stu this question because I, I, it's, it's an interesting one of like, where do you think that your standard of play that you played that week would have finished in like the USAM? Like, do you think you would have been like tenth in stroke play? Like, do you feel like you played really, really well, better than you played during the AM? Do you understand? You know, what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Because Stu was like, "Yeah, I might have missed the cut. I might have missed match play by one shot." Where do you think you know those first two rounds would have put you? 
Yeah, I definitely think the one under I threw up on the first day would have been one of the best scores at a U.S. Amateur if we had that type of field. You know, the thing is Amateur Golf, Nick Dunlap showed that Amateur Golf is in such a great place right now. There's so many good players. And yeah, of course, there's probably going to be a guy who gets really hot. She's five or six. But, um, you know, there weren't going to be a lot of under par scores those first two days. And I feel like, you know, at three over, I definitely, you know, I'm definitely top 32 in match play. Obviously, that field for match play is, or for the U.S. Amateurs, like 350-some guys or something, yeah. like 316 guys. 312, so, I think, yeah. Yeah, something along those lines. And so... Like it's um you know to try and make that cut is really difficult because you gotta play play your butt off, uh and can't really make any doubles. But um yeah, I definitely think you know at USA Amateur I'm making the cut comfortably with that that type of showing. Uh, I want to go through your I want to go through your your week kind of start to finish because the Masters tournament is, you know, it's the one that leans the most into amateurs. Bobby Jones famously won't you know has have always wanted an amateur to win the uh, event. It hasn't happened the crow's nest, the whole deal. Like when you, when your week starts at the Masters, what kind of instructions are you given upon arrival? Like even when I go check into a hotel, I'm a little bit nervous. Like, who do I talk to? Like, where? Like, I've never been here before. I don't know what to do. You arrive at the Masters tournament as, you know, uh, fifth year, you're a grad student, OSU. Here you are at the Masters tournament. How does it even start? Where do you check in? Who do you talk to? Yeah, yeah. So you can go straight to, to tournament headquarters. I got there on Saturday. It's pretty empty. I was the fourth guy to check in, um, and you know, they it was funny. My my caddy missed his flight, so he wasn't going to get until that night. And I went to go. You're muted, Dan. Dan, you muted. Sorry, sorry. How did he miss his flight? <laughs> so he is flying out of Madison, Wisconsin, <laughs> and he got to the airport an hour and a half early. And there's only there's one Delta flight going to Atlanta, and he got there an hour and a half early no check baggage and nothing. He uh, was in the TSA line. It took him an hour and 15 minutes to get through a TSA line because only had one machine working and they had like three flights going out and him and like 25 other people missed, missed their flight to Atlanta that oh. morning. So he ended up going to like, he ended up doing some roundabout way. He went from like Madison to LaGuardia, LaGuardia to Atlanta, Atlanta to uh, Augusta, like just to get there from Saturday night. It was a, such a mess. Dude, that's a nightmare. He must have had yeah. the worst anxiety of all time when he's like, I would have yeah, been I, 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 te- I texted him in the morning. I was like, oh, you good? You're going to make your flight? And he texted me like, yeah, I got the airport right now. Should be all right. And then I get a text back from him two hours later, miss my flight. I'm like, dude, what the heck happened <laughs> How did here? you miss your flight to the Masters? We're in the, we're, we're in the Masters, man. <laughs> yeah. It was luck, 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 luckily, luckily I didn't really need him Saturday, but I, you know, I went to go carry my bag onto the range and one of the guys, you know, the ANWA was going on and one of the guys that I'd known, uh, who works the bag room and everything, he's like, he came over and he's like, what are you doing carrying your bag? Like, let me get that. I'm like, what, am I not allowed to carry my bag here? Or like, <laughs> like, can I, I can't do anything for us. I was so funny. I was like, I was like, oh, I kind of I guess doing some no-no things. Yep. Um. All right, so day one, you're there Saturday. You're early. There's nobody around. What's your, what's your? Are you allowed to start playing on on Sunday, or can you not? You, you can, when can you start playing your practice rounds? Yeah, so you can go Saturday afternoon. Um, you can play Sunday as well. Um, after, but you can't. Yet it's like it's weird because the drive chip and putts going on, so you can't go off too early because that has to finish up. And same thing, yeah, and what has to finish before you tee off, um, on the big course, but. Practice facilities are fully open to us. We have, you know, access to everything, which is really nice because you can get there early, start adjusting to the speed of greens and everything. That's that's kind of my goal for the first two days was let's adjust to the speed of greens, the grass, all that. And then the second part was, you know, on Sunday, we just went and scouted the golf course with a range finder and our yardage books and kind of did all that work and, you know, got, you know, you know stepped off some of the ridges so you know how far up they are because the yardage book they give you doesn't it's give you a lot bones. of information. I, it's it, it crazy. Is. Yeah, I made a little video is about this. Right? It, oh, it looks that. completely different. The PJ Tour ones, they don't have the percentage of slopes anymore. You're obviously not watching the videos we're putting on social media, which is fine. But I don't they... see all of them, Dan. I'll be honest with that. I <laughs> There's don't, all I don't these need arrows. To, I see your mug plenty. We do this goddamn show twice a week. <laughs> yeah. There's all these arrows and like heat maps, and they don't and the Gusta one has like maybe a runoff, but it's way more bare wow. bones. Yeah, here. I got it right here. It's like uh literally this is the one I didn't use this one in competition. But it literally looks like this is 10. This is all they have on 10. It's like they have that, that, <laughs> and that. So, like, we have to shoot all the, uh, you know, slope adjustments and we have to walk off these slopes. Or, like, a green, like, great example of walking. I was on 14. 
you have, you know, the slope kind of changes the entire time here. So you have to kind of like step, you have to step all of it off to make sure you know the cover numbers whenever you're getting your number out of the fairway because there's no range finders or anything. So like you have to know if you're going over this angle, okay, I have to cover 15 steps on the green if I'm going over that ridge or all that. And it's crazy. I mean, all the, if you, if you watch a practice round, you, there's, you know, you'll see groups of like eight or 10 caddies and there'll be like two guys standing on the greens on different ridges and all the guys are shooting things from all the discs and all the plates on, on the rain, on the uh, fairway. It's, it's like, you know, a few armies out there doing that stuff. So it's, it's pretty nuts. Um, those guys, you got to do a lot of work to kind of get prepared for the tournament. That's wild. I didn't realize that it's that bare bones. That's awesome. I kind of love that. Um, I love too, like, you know, I've, I've gone through and read a ton about how, and I know Tiger's talked about this a lot, how they always make changes to the course, but they don't really like disclose necessarily all of the changes. And so guys kind of show up that have been going there forever and they'll notice, you know, whatever it might be, the back edge or the right edge on 11 is different or the, or the back kind of part of you go long on six was like a little different that tiger was talking about and he shows up and has to kind of figure all that stuff out in the first couple of days yeah yeah and even even one like I, one that you don't notice this year was uh number two that's a new green this year they've got like, completely changed it some of the slopes it's i mean it's pretty much the same as it was before but um they've expanded some of the back edges and changed the ridge a little bit and made yeah, there's a new severe. pin on the back they use it on thursday yeah that was that was nuts that pin there too that's a good one <laughs> uh so how much time did you spend in the crow's nest did you get are you, are you up there much were you there for I, I was there for a night i went there on monday night after the amateur dinner i was up there with christo and jasper Stubbs, and uh it was a lot of fun we, we were up there watching the national championship uh did some film up there with i think one of the cbs crews and it was, it was, it was a cool night that's awesome yeah i, I was uh, i wasn't sure because i think i saw something about yeah, like most of the amateurs will do a night there, but then they kind of go do more comfortable accommodations or whatever. Summer is all about the freedom to have fun, but you do not need to blow your budget on a trip to make the most of it. We're talking about a tequila cation with the mm. new Truly Tequila Sodas, Dan. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I, this, is, this is like member guest fuel. I've got one coming up this week. I will be mm. loaded up on the Tequila Trulies. I think it's going to be the drink of the weekend. They got a bunch of great flavors. They got lime, pineapple, guava, grapefruit, and watermelon. All, all of those with 5% ABV and just 100 calories. You can kind of drink them all day, especially in a memory guest. Take a tequila cation with the new Truly Tequila Soda today. They're delicious. It's a refreshing blend of real fruit juice from concentrate, sparkling water, and premium tequila blanco is the drink of the summer Truly tequila soda. Try them. Four flavors. They're delicious. Again, 5% ABV, just 100 calories. Tequila cation time. Truly tequila soda. Keep it light. Hard seltzer beverage company, Boston, Massachusetts. Please drink responsibly. Who'd you stay with for the week? Do you guys have like a big house with your family or what was the setup? Yeah, yeah, we did one house that was a little smaller near the golf course for me and my team. So I was like my caddy, girlfriend, uh, swing coach, and I beat a friend pop in there for a few days. Uh, and then we had the other house, which I called the party house, is a little bit further away from the golf course, a little bigger. And we had tons of friends and family out there. And um, it was, uh, I, I heard some stories about what was going on in the evenings there. And I'm pretty glad I wasn't around. Yeah, you can't be, you got too much, too much work to do to be going to the party house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, did you make your way there Sunday night at all? Maybe. Yeah, we were out there Sunday night, and uh, we we it was cool. But uh, what ended up happening that night was, uh, you know, we finally get everyone gets back on their phones, and you know, we're kind of everyone's gone through social media, and you're like, Neil, like you're, you're kind of like showing up on a lot of memes right now, dude. <laughs> yeah, you're everywhere, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, what? What do you mean? What memes? Because we we didn't watch the Butler Cabin ceremony live. And so I had no idea what was what happened until like two hours afterwards. Well, these guys like, can oh, relate to you because the first time they were on Golf Channel, they stared they stared at themselves the entire time, and it looked terrible. Not they; it was Trent Ryan because we were oh, okay. we did it, and I can't wait to hear your version of the whole thing because we've had we had Doug Gim on the show a bunch of times. He's a good buddy of ours. He won low amateur there, and he's told us a bunch of stories about that Butler Cabin ceremony. And he's like they he's like they give you all these instructions. And then you're like, you don't really have time to memorize it or remember. And the next thing you know, you're in like the most important 
sort of quiet, awkward ceremony in the history of the world on CBS. And he's like, it's, it all happened so fast. So I'm excited to hear your side. But when we were on Golf Channel for the first time, myself and Trent, and we were in this room at like, uh, in like 30 Rock up there in this like small little studio room. And it didn't have a screen where we, we were on with Matt Janella was interviewing us. So we just could hear him in the ear. And then we were supposed to look at the camera. And then there was a screen at the bottom on the floor that just had us, but not him. And so the whole time me and Trent are sitting next to each other and he's just looking at us on the ground and I was looking into the camera and he did it the entire time. And so we were thinking you must have been looking at a screen or something. What were you looking at? Yeah, yeah. It was a teleprompter. So, you know, like you guys mentioned, they give you all these instructions. Um, I know like one big thing this year is like uh, Sam Bennett ran off the TV pretty quickly last year. So that uh, I don't, that was, became a little bit of a mini meme. But I they, they told me like when you when they go to put the jacket on, you just stand up real slowly and slowly walk away. And um, Jim, <laughs> like Jim Nance, right before we started, just threw he's like, oh, by the way, I'm going to say something to you about this. And I was like, wait, 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 I didn't catch that. Like, what do you say you're going to tell me? And so I was like, <laughs> so I was like so freaking nervous. Um, yep. And I was just, you know, I just didn't want to speak out of turn or say something when I wasn't supposed to. So I was looking at a teleprompter, look, waiting for like when they were going to ask me the question. So it kind of cue me in. And so I was like, and then, and then I like completely sidestepped Jim Nance's question completely, which was pretty funny too. But I, that was, uh, that was, that was, that was pretty funny. You had a couple <laughs> interesting interactions with the press, you know, it was probably a lot more media attention than, than you, than you got at the US Amateur, even though you're, if, if you haven't, if, if the listeners haven't seen the USA, the shot that clinched the Masters for you, you hit it to like a foot, and you knew you knew what what you had done, and it was an electric, electric moment. Um, yeah, so that so that interaction with where they were t- when they were asking you about Tiger right in the thing, and you kind of looked over, just like walk us through that because I was in the room, I didn't think it was that awkward. I just thought you kind of didn't know what the guy was talking about, but I think the problem was you got the question and you looked directly at the Augusta member, which almost made it seem like <laughs> there was some sort of ritual. Like why, like that this guy is in on it. Like, why would this guy know? So kind of walk us through what happened there. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess in that press room, I'd, I'd interacted with probably 90% of the press that was in there or knew, like I knew you guys knew your faces and everything. Uh, so when I, when I, uh, when I got that question from this dude, I had no idea who he was. He's sitting in the back corner and he asked me something just it's so weird. I was like that. And it didn't happen. And I just kind of looked over to the guy like, who in the world is this dude? What was that? That was kind of like my first reaction. It's like, what type of question is this? Because like it, like, it just didn't happen. Like, I just didn't get a note. I wish, like, if I got a note and Tiger gave me his number or something, like, that would have, I, I would have happily been like, yeah, Tiger just popped me his number, you know, and, you know, or something like that and kind of flexed it. But nothing happened. I thought that he went back to the tampon joke well. I was like, wow, he really, he's really committed yep. to that bit. So then what I did was I pulled up the eighth hole and I was like, did Tiger outdrive him on this hole? Because that's what happened with JT. Turns out you smoked it like 70 by him on that hole. So I was like, all right, definitely wasn't that. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. The, the other thing is too, on eight, like he'd put it right of the right bunker. And I was in the left half of the fairway. Like we weren't even in the same like zip code. Like <laughs> I think there's no, at no point would have even been close enough to hand me something. Yeah, I did see people were fishing for that one, but I did when people were like, people were really dissecting the interaction. It did look like you looked to a green jacket and that they had like one of those dog collar buttons and they were like, <laughs> if you say, if you don't answer this properly, we're going to zap you. Uh, but I was thinking too, the same thing you said. I was like, if Tiger like gave him his number, I imagine Neil would have just been like, oh, Tiger gave me his phone number, which is the coolest thing in the world. Yeah. Yeah. If, if it was something cool, I would have, I mean, if it had happened, it'd been cool. It would have been hilarious if Tiger actually gave me a note and was like, hey, don't t- tell tell the press there wasn't a note. They'll go crazy yeah. about it. That would have been hilarious. <laughs> that would have been unbelievable. Yeah. But what, did he, uh, what did he say to you uh, after? It looked like he had some nice words for you. Obviously, he was laboring. He wasn't playing very well. 82-77. But you, you, know, you played nicely. I, I, you didn't finish as well. I think you were one under for a lot of the round. What did he have to say to you afterwards? Yeah, you know, it, it was just, you know, he's like, hey, really enjoyed today. You know, great round. I think he mentioned something about like, you know, it's, you, you played really well today. Kind of that type of deal. Um, you know, and it was cool throughout the day. You know, we got to talk about a bunch of different things and felt like I got to know him pretty well, um, well relatively well. And so I, I just really, you know, just really enjoyed the day. And it, it was cool to get some praise from a guy like that. Yeah, I would say so.
Was there a lot of, uh, you know, nice shot, nice putt stuff going on back and forth? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the first one I got, I, I mean, I roped the drive on number two and we're walking off the jeans like, hey, good drive there. And I kind of like, kind of like pinched myself for a little bit. I was like, wow, that's the coolest thing that just ever happened. Tiger Woods just said good, good drive to me. That's that, that was, that was, that was pretty funny. I felt like yeah. a little kid there for a second. You didn't, you didn't get the 2019 Tiger uh, treatment. You, you know that story with Tony Finau? Mm-mm, no. Oh, uh, so they're playing together and, and Tony's in the final group and you know, there was threesomes that day because uh the rain and stuff, so it's Tiger, Molinari and and Fino and Fino's like, Yeah, you know, I just I hadn't spoken to him the whole day. Uh we were just kind of in our own worlds and you know, they both kind of hit drives on eight and Tony knows Tiger, right? Like they've played in tournaments together all the time. And so Tony goes up to Tiger and goes, Yo, Tiger, how are your kids? And he goes, They're good. <laughs> and just walks dead straight. And Tony's like, all right, I got the message. He's trying to win the Masters. I'll, I'll stop. He said, I didn't say another word to him for the rest of the day. He goes, how's your kids? They're good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I bet you, you know, the fact that we were 11 over, 12 over to start the day probably helped us be a little bit more loose. But it was, uh, yeah, no, it was definitely more of a casual round. I'd say that. That makes a lot of sense. I, uh, you know, being up, up close with him. We talk obviously a ton on this show about Tiger, Tiger's game, Tiger's prospects. I bet on him to win every single tournament he plays in because uh, he's the greatest player of all time. You know, how'd you feel his actual game was? Because it, it felt to me like the first couple rounds, it felt like he had a, a god, god, like a pretty goddamn good golf game, especially with somebody who hasn't really played much. It just, you know, he ran out of gas or he started to get more sore or whatever the hell it might have been. It was more physical limitations than golf game. Were you impressed at all about kind of his golf game? What was your takeaway from where his game's actually at? Definitely, yeah. His iron play is definitely still there. Uh, I mean, that's a, re- that's a really strong all day, he, especially the long irons. I mean, it's just really solid. Um, definitely up to the level of the other guys, tour guys I played with. Um, short game's definitely still there, too. He still has great touch around the greens. Um, you know, I think when I played with him, you know, he is kind of struggling and hitting the driver a little bit, and he kind of he started to just kind of go to a, just a putt all day. Um, so I think he saw that on 15, he hit pretty short cause his end of the wind had to hit a cut or even the drive on 17. He started that thing so far left and just cut it back in there. Um, so he just, I think he's just kind of playing with what he had. One thing that, um, for me, you know, I, I noticed was he was leaving a lot of putts short and didn't yeah. make that adjustment. Um, I feel like, you know, if it was, you know, that could be, you know, mental or maybe just have not having played a lot of tournaments, you know, having to adjust on the fly like that is a little harder when you're not as um acclimated to playing tournaments but you know the game's still there and i think if he has a really hot week and a week where his body holds up he's still definitely capable of winning these golf tournaments yeah i want to ask you about about you you've got quite an interesting background what it, it, did you have you gotten a lot better it was, it was kind of the the juxt of my question because you know you started off at jmu and if you you know you're what were you a quant math major or something yeah, it's quantitative finance. Yeah, okay. I was kind quantitative of quantitative finance. So a quantitative yeah. finance major at JMU is not really thinking about the PGA tour, I would think. So did you have this massive leap? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I was not uh the best junior golf in the world. I was ranked definitely probably outside the top two hundred in my class. I, I can't remember. There's a tweet that came out Jesus. about it I, during the Amber. I was uh yeah, definitely not ranked super well. I kind of got l- into the like national junior scene pretty late. Then start playing a lot of the AJGA tournaments until probably my junior year. Um, so like I was, I was behind the eight ball and I, you know, got the GMU and made a lot of the starting lineups early and kept playing really well. And um, academics is always really important to me. And I, that's why I decided to do that quant major. Um, but, you know, my game kind of started to click around my sophomore year a bit better. And then, you know, as I had the opportunity to transfer after graduating. Uh, three years so did that and got here to Ohio State and I think I learned a lot about my game here being around a lot better players um not not nothing against my teammates at JMU but you know Maxwell Moldvin he's he's a you know been the top a top 25 player I think top he's ninth player. in the PGA Tour U right now yeah he is I and mean, he's such a good player and so solid and you know he's been having a you know he's had a great college career uh, I think he's been uh you know all-american two last two years or so a couple of U.S. Um, Opens Yep, yeah, two is open. So, you know, I learned a lot about how to really compete at a high level from him and the consistency of his game, consistency of his ball striking, and especially his play from like 100, 150. And that's where I was really struggling with. You know, I didn't really hit my short irons great when I came in. And, you know, with my length, 
you know, if you can hit your short irons really good, then you're going to give yourself a lot of birdie opportunities. So I started to do that great and started putting well. And, uh, you know, I think that that's kind of like the trajectory. It's just been like a slow climb and, you know, kind of finally gotten where I think I need to be to really compete uh, on the world's biggest stage. How fucking good are the golf courses in Columbus? They're so good. We have it's so many joke. good golf courses. Columbus, yeah, like pound for pound, might be number one. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you want to go, you know, you have Brookside, which is, you know, they've, they've had US Open qualifying there for a while. That's such a great tournament course. You have Double Eagle north of town, which is just pure. Um, Mirfield Village is awesome. Sayota is great as well. Your guys' we course go- is pretty good, isn't it? Scarlet course? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's great, great, great loud. You know, it, it gets a little furry, you know, throughout the year. But, man, it, it's just such a good place to, you know, you got to drive it really well out there and hit your irons great. So it's a great place for us to practice because it, it kind of beats your brains in if you're not playing well. So that's great. And you also have uh, the golf club, which is, an, I think we have like three top hundreds. I think it's like golf club, Sayota and Mirfo Village are all top hundred courses in town. It, it, they're awesome. We get to go out th- to each of those a few times a year. It's it, it's really, really fun. Uh, you're going to have a hell of a summer. Uh, walk us through a little bit of your, your summer schedule because you're playing some big stuff. Yeah. You know, you know, this summer is a little bit more up in the air just because of status and all that, but I'll definitely be playing US Open. Definitely be going to... Uh, you know, go try go qualify for the British Open as well. So we got Pinehurst and then uh, I think, was it the Troon this year, I think? Hopefully, yep. um, possibly going out to La Hinge for the Palmer Cup as well. Um, you know, in the this past summer, I mean, we played, uh, you know, I played the Sunny Hannah Amateur, played the Trans Mississippi at Brook Hollow Golf Club in uh, T- Dallas, which is an awesome golf course. You know, we played uh, Capilano Golf Club in Vancouver, which I think was one of the top clubs courses in in canada i mean the place is awesome but the western amateur at uh north shore which is great and then obviously cherry hills like we get to go play these top-notch courses all the time in amateur golf it's really a treat where's the usam this year uh i think it's hazeltine i don't think i'm gonna be an amateur for that yeah but... i was gonna say you're gonna t- what's, you're gonna turn pro and try to get some exemptions and maybe to q school because you're not you're not in the top 10 are you in the in pj tour you no i'll probably have to go to q school i might i Unfortunately, PG Tour, you don't count the summer events. Uh, so because of that, a lot of the, my great finishes don't kind of go on to they that. They don't count so. the USAM? No, they don't, which it is what it is. I know. I know. It's That's one. That's the one run like a bunch of bullshit. I'll that's, say that's what, just what, kind of, what kind of, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> that's crazy. I the know. Biggest... It's funny. It's funny. I'm like 36 in the World Amateur rankings, but I think my PGA Tour U is like 55 or something like that, which is <laughs> kind of funny how. But I mean, that's, it's just how it goes. You know, I'm getting the raw end of the stick right now, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, two, three years down the line, it doesn't matter where you ended up in PGA Tour U. It's about the quality of your play. And that, that's how I'm kind of treating it. That's wild. That's absolutely wild. It, it, all the ranking systems are kind of like, even the world amateur ranking system, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say this about it. If you're a mid-major guy, it, it's, it's so hard to get into the top 300 because, if you're a power five school, a quality power five school, you play against the best teams and the best players all the time. So the events you play are, are always super highly ranked and you don't have to finish top 10 to get quality points from it. But if you're a mid-major guy, they, you know, the rankings of those events are really rough. And so if you're like, if you're at James Madison, if you're a top 300 player at James Madison, you might be in reality a top 50 player in the world because you got to go and finish like top. 10 or top five every week to get there and you know when you go to those mid-major events every team has two or three really really solid players like you gotta go out there and beat you know 40 guys who are all really good so it you know but it's it's just kind of how the system is and um it's a kind of a shame for those mid-major schools you know i think that's a big uh a big problem you see in a lot of sports where these mid-major schools kind of get you know just kind of get uh you know shafted yeah uh so what do you got now? You're going straight for the Masters to studying for finals or something? Yeah, we're, we're back in Columbus. I'm, I'm in my crummy little apartment right now. Uh, you know, we have our uh, we have our we have our home event here uh, this weekend. So I'll be teeing up Friday, Saturday, Sunday in that. We have a few days off and go off to Big Tens, which is at Sayota this year. So we got two home games Sick. in a row. So that's uh, awesome. Uh, I saw on golf. There's a little golf.com. I think it was piece on. Uh, you were at Waffle House. I didn't catch the whole thing. What's uh, you know? I grew up. I'm from St. Charles, Missouri. We're big Waffle House people. What's your what's your go to Waffle House order? 
Uh, it's a all star white toast, uh, scrambled eggs, uh, hash browns, and a chocolate chip waffle. That's kind of what we go with with a coffee and a water. Um, you know, that's I've, a man I've, who's been a few times. That's I knew you're gonna go all star. I'm an all star guy too. I go scrambled eggs. I usually substitute the bacon for the sausage, and I go just plain waffle. I like like you know Dave Portnoy says like if you're gonna go to a italian place you just get their spaghetti and you just see like what do you really got you know and if you go to a steakhouse you just get their you know new york strip and you see what they got i'm sort of like i like to go to waffle house because i just want to see their original waffle hit me with that waffle and it's so we're same i just i don't get the uh chocolate on the uh the waffle yeah i just i just i just like a little bit of sugar i'm you gotta keep i'm a big guy gotta keep me fueled you know the <laughs> extra calories uh dan you don't strike me as a guy that's ever been to a waffle house uh, i went once uh after the masters one year because it was the only thing open it's delicious <laughs> man it's so good yeah. i got a bunch of them in north it carolina is. too so i've been known to on the way from rdu from raleigh airport late you get in late like you're just saying uh, there's like a flight that goes from Phoenix and I go down to Pinehurst quite a bit. So I'll definitely see you there. We'll see you there, which is going to be awesome. But on that flight, I get in at like 1130 at night and then there'll be nothing open and there's a couple waffle houses on the way. So I'll stop at like a, a 1 a.m. or a 1230 a.m. on like a Monday night waffle house in bumfuck North Carolina. It's a little dicey in there, but the food always delivers every time. Yeah, I, I was big on uh, like studying at waffle houses at JMU, you, you know, with the quant major. I was like, I'd be up till all hours of the night. And if I wanted to get like three or four cups of coffee in, I'd go get a waffle and some coffee. And I just, I'd like read my textbook while I was in there and just, just absolutely pound coffee, you know, cause <laughs> you just buy one coffee and you can get as many cups for free as you want. So I get, day. you know, that was kind of my, that's kind of my, like, you know, if I'm hungry at like 10 o'clock and was going to study till two or two thirty, you know, that's what we ended up doing. You got to have some NIL money flowing in now, I would think, after this finish and stuff. Like, I see a couple logos going on, right? Like, there's got to be a little bit of a financial bump that comes from this. That's something we can talk about now with, with you know, college players. Yeah, yeah, it's been it's been great. You know, I have I've a team that has done a great job. Um, I have some great partners that I really have enjoyed, uh, you know, you know, partnering with. And, you know, they've been really great to me. Uh, you know, the Nicholas brand apparel was great for the Masters. And we're going to be sticking with them for the U.S. Open. Um one of my partners on my uh, the chess logo ramp they've been great to me uh the kane anderson they were on the side of my hat and uh sleeve and that's a long time friend and they they've really stepped up huge you get the invite uh, to terry ed from that guy <laughs> yeah so I, I i know him uh pretty well and i, I hope to get out there eventually uh that place is really good yeah I know so this guy rick kane there. i think he's an la guy i think he's a riviera member he's he's got terry ed and then they have another one tay Arai, i think it's called that they just built so that's a good. Yeah. That's a good guy to keep on your good side. Yeah, oh, is that definitely, definitely. That's uh, there's some good courses that my guys the, that I know personally is on the real estate side of things, and he's been he's been following me since I was like eleven or twelve. He, we have the same swing coach, and that's kind of funny. All that you know, we've been really good friends for a long time, and uh, I've been out to a few of his buddy trips. He's at Nantucket Golf Club, and we did a little trip out there and uh, had a blast. So. Um, yeah, and then J Lab is headphones, and I love been loving their product too. They're soon great. I kind of was uh, didn't have enough headphones around, and then they gave us a call, and I was like, yeah, I'd love to try the product. And that's a good really one good for stuff. a college kid. That's money. The headphones are key. Absolutely, it's especially as much as I travel. It's just you got to have like two or three pairs, and you have some for home and some for the backpack and everything. So it's pr- pretty pretty massive. Unreal. All right, Neil. Well, man, it was an awesome week. It was very fun to watch you out there. You just pound the ball. You remind me a little. You got a little John Daly action. You just kind of grip it and absolutely swing away at that thing. And then watching you in there with Tiger and how well you played with Tiger. I don't know how the hell you did that. That like I was getting nervous just watching you guys out there. So uh, congratulations, dude. It was a really sick week. It was fun to watch. And uh, I think a lot of people were jealous you got to play with Tiger Woods on Sunday at the Masters. Yeah, it was an unbelievable experience. It was uh, once in a lifetime and uh, glad I really got to enjoy it and take it in. Hell yeah, brother. All right, man. Well, good luck this summer. We'll see you around at different events and uh, and keep going. Keep cranking. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me on. This is a lot of fun. 